What did you have for breakfast today? I had one of my favorite homemade Soylent shakes. Soylent? It's my own DIY oh, okay. recipe because I can't actually have any or most commercial protein drinks and powders. Okay. So, I'm allergic, allergic to soy. Oh, wow. Okay. So what's what's in it? Uh, raw egg, matcha powder, frozen berries, and then pretty much an assortment of whatever else I happen to have in my fridge or freezer, which today was beetroot, apple, honey, and some oatmeal. Wow. Pretty much just throw any given breakfast food in it. Yeah. Generally turns out okay. And is that like the aim of the day is to have the healthiest thing possible in the morning? Healthiest and can actually get it down. I've tried to do kale and apple ones a couple of times and struggled to get it in and just didn't have enough calories and was hungry by 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So. Well, tasty. Hey there, how you doing? My name is Jordan Michaelides and I co-founded Neural with my partner, Lauren. We built the Uncommon podcast to interview unique individuals and investigate interesting topics, therefore allowing our community to build the quote-unquote uncommon sense crucial to increasing their intelligence. And our investigations and interviews are largely inspired by people like Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss, Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's business partner, and particularly in Charlie Munger, who always really emphasized that worldly wisdom is incredibly important, not just for entrepreneurs and investors, but for your own growth as an individual. And he always used certain quotes, and the one that I love the most is um, Abraham Maslow's quote, which is, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I think by saying that, what he's trying to emphasize is that if only if you only have a certain skill set or knowledge base, then all you will see is that cognitive bias related to that skill set or knowledge base. And therefore, you need to broaden that. So we are really trying to investigate and uncover new guests and new topics for our community. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can head to neural.com slash podcast. I hope you enjoy. This podcast has been an experiment and we need your feedback as a subscriber. So leave us a review, make your way to learn more about the competition and prizes that we have going. Uh, That is at neural.com slash podcast, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E. Some of the prizes include an Apple Watch 2 for all you high performers out there, a Kindle Paperwhite for you book nerds, an Amazon gift card for everyone else. We, you can also sign up to our, I guess, weekly brain food, which is the Monday morsels at neural.com slash sign up. Make sure you check it out. In this episode, we recorded with Ren Butler. Now, Ren by day is Blue Chili's entrepreneur in residence and by night, founder of the Whiskey Social. Um, so you could say that she likes her whiskey old and her startups young. Uh, she has a unique perspective on building marketable products across a multitude of industries, whether it's tourism to tech and whiskey itself. Her love for whiskey and the passion for this project is, I think, what all founders should strive for. Um, in our conversation, we covered a bunch of ideas and notes that startup founders and lovers of alcohol alike can take away. So some of the topics included her windy road to blue chili, the conception of the whiskey social, the process of appreciating whiskey versus wine, her guiding principles in life and habits developed as a result of those principles. Um, I hope you enjoy and thanks for listening. Okay, we're live. Cool. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. Um, Now, Ren, maybe let's start with... Um, you know, we're going to have a little bio there for you on the, I guess, the show notes. But what I'm interested to hear or what brought a Californian to Melbourne? Well, initially it was Monash. So 
I knew I was kind of done with my stage in California at that point in time. And in retrospect, it was really good because a number of the things that my job and career path there were dependent on were literally getting closed or burning down, um, i.e. the state and national parks. (laughs) Um, So I started looking for opportunities um, either to get work and therefore get a beast pathway over that way or, um, or to go back to university and all roads pretty much en- ended in go back to uni, um, do another degree. And since I was working in education and travel, it was going to be one of those two things that I was going to study. Um, and the program that I found that jumped out at me was Monash's, uh, international sustainable tourism program because it had the business and economic tie-in that I was looking for in an opportunity. Okay. And what, what were you doing? What had you studied anything in that area beforehand? Uh, A large part of my undergraduate degree was in sustainable tourism from a natural resource perspective. So how to design programs that helped educate and entertain people in the ecotourism space. Okay. Well, it's quite interesting because, um, I mean, the company that I work for, Ibis World, we're actually talking about right now how skill sets in tourism are so important purely because of what's happening to Australia in terms of the prime industry, so to speak. You know, we're flipping from being mining, mining services. We've still got a property bubble, but... Um, yeah, tourism, they're, they're saying at the moment that I think we get like 1% of the traveling Chinese in the world. And they've, Chinese tourists have overtaken the UK and the US combined. Um, and the projections for that to become like 3% and what that would do to the economy, it's very interesting. Well, and the interesting challenge there is there's a couple layers to that. Yeah. One is the type of Chinese tourist that Australia has historically um, attracted over the last few years has been very narrow. So from, you know, from the startup land perspective, we're talking about, you know, less than 0.1% of the, the total type of traveler or tourist. So they've all had to be mass market, you know, pre-booked tours in China that then have their existing networks set up over here. So there's been uh, high levels of what's called in, in the industry, a not so palatable term. The official term is leakage. Um, <laughs> so economic leakage, which basically the more that you book and prepay for things in your country of origin before you go and travel, the less the country you travel to actually sees much economic right. benefit. So we're slowly starting to see the type of traveler uh, change, change yeah. from the Chinese market over here. I mean, China is such a massive country with so many diverse types of people and markets and priorities and backgrounds that you, we really have to evolve to create more interesting and dynamic products and services to attract the the growing and um highly dynamic traveler that's going to be coming from um, places like China and other um, and other new markets that you know we might deem as emerging yeah. but in a lot of ways there's they're actually much more uh, far far along the evolution of types of travelers and and what they're looking for yeah but I think I think at the end of the day um, the the important thing is to put a priority on the types of skills that you need for hospitality and customer service and hospitality and tourism as much as a lot of times people don't think of them as long-term career choices if they're ambitious they're incredibly valuable skills and if i'm looking to hire or even if i'm looking to recruit a co-founder i will definitely take someone with at least a few months if not a few years in hospitality or some sort of intense challenging service role in their past that they probably totally discount and don't think of as particularly professional experience. But I'm going to rate that much higher than someone that has a fancy MBA from, you know, (laughs) cha-ching university. (laughs) It's it's funny you mention that because I know 
I did hospitality at a very very early age. I used to be super introverted. Well, I think that I still am. It's just that now I don't have any problems speaking to people at all. But it's quite amazing how hospitality changed that um, over the years. It's sort of just you're constantly pushed into, I guess, environments where it's so nerve-wracking that eventually you just become used to it. Like the amount of times that I, ha- I had, I don't know, what's the most Im- – embarrassing thing that you've ever done in terms of a client facing role but i just remember the amount of times i've spilled alcohol on people um once gave someone what is it, they had like a lobster allergy and we gave them lobster oh jeez. um yeah so but anyway I, i'm interested to know so as we get into talking about your role what you do um ha- so blue chili and um Whiskey Social. Um, what have have you noticed any tourism startups coming from Blue Chili? So we did we do did have one in our portfolio um, in our earlier days, not a Melbourne based one, but a Sydney based one. The founder um, actually uh, spun it down and sold the core components um, or passed it along to someone else to take care of. It's called Adventure Honey. Um, Really interesting idea. It was it was basically a, a niche idea around um, uh, high intensity, like adrenaline junkie type travel uh, opportunities, and wanting to connect. Um, interestingly enough, to connect more to uh, local opportunities and service providers to find more interesting, authentic, um, off the beaten path types of uh, adventure travel products. And that's actually really squarely in the space of what I was um, looking to study, not necessarily the adrenaline junkie adventure part in the, uh, in the formal sense, but um, what I ended up uh, going to study in that second degree um, after I left teaching science out of the woods and desert in California, um, you know, as you do, uh, I, I studied tourism and ultimately I became fascinated with this idea of the the dynamic and the who gets to design the product in terms of product experience from in a tourism perspective, who gets to design it, who gets to market it and have that power and control over the marketing message. Um, and then ultimately how is it uh, consumed and what benefit is that to the people that are connected because we're living in a world, you know, 7.4 close to 5.5 billion and growing. Um, and yet more and more people are complaining about the tools that we have to connect each other. Um, you know, of the 40 something percent of people who are connected to the internet reliably, hopefully that will get better, um, in the coming decade, but people are, complaining about connection and people really want connection. But ultimately the thing I found was even with well-intentioned altruistic tourism, um, sometimes callously dubbed save the world tourism, uh, the power is typically all in the hands of the marketer and the, the dollar, whoever that money is coming from. And the communities end up essentially having volunteers foisted on them. They make a couple of bucks to host them and come up with, odd jobs for these people to do to feel like they're helping. Um, And at the end of the day, the value exchange and the value creation in that process, I just didn't feel was particularly um, compelling or effective. I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Yeah. And and so tell us about your role at Blue Chili. So you got into that. (laughs) So through a windy, windy road, um, I finished when I finished up my degree, I was picking up some hours at a, a market research call center because I'd had a lot of market research um, exposure through my academic uh, career, both undergrad and, and postgrad. And it was, you know, decent money, flexible hours, but, you know, by no means was something I saw myself doing all my, all my life. Uh, but it, it really helped work on those, you know, cold approaches and talking to people and getting people to open up and talk about their opinions and whatnot, which is a very valuable skill. Um, I ended up volunteering to help put a gig on for a rapper out of Minnesota that I basically met through YouTube Mm -hmm. and then found on Facebook and then just randomly put a thing up on his Facebook wall. Yeah, this is, this is an interesting story that not a whole lot of people know about me. My close (laughs) friends do. Um, basically I put a message up on 
Facebook saying, if you're ever thinking about coming to Australia, please let me know. I'd love to help out. And I have a very few friends that are in the um, mainly Sydney hip hop scene, but a couple here. Um, and who is this rapper? His name is Astronautilus. <laughs> um, and he tours extensively, but he'd only ever been down here to Australia once. And I looked at his tour dates in the States when I was about to go back over there to visit family and they didn't line up. So it was basically it was foreseeing this future where it was going to probably be at least another couple of years before I was going to get to see him live. And I was like, I'll put my hand up for this. Why not? So there are a couple of other people, a couple of other fans that he already had in, um, in the country from his one little tour opening for uh, another band before. And they were in touch with his manager, but they basically all dropped out. Right. So I ended up uh, having to get an ABN, start a production company, uh, recruit a whole bunch of my friends to do graphic design and help me with social media management and postering and basically just mass all hands on deck volunteer situation. Um, and basically for the couple hundred bucks that I could scrape up of spare cash that I had, um, in retrospect, I have no idea where I even found that. Always the case. <laughs> but if you have, if something's a priority, you find the money. Um, so I ended up put, uh, getting him booked at the Northcote social club here in Melbourne and uh, a tiny little, hole in the wall in Sydney. The Sydney show was a real struggle because it was the same night as uh, Snoop Dogg. So <laughs> a little bit of competition there with people who uh, consider themselves hip hop heads. But, um, but yeah, it all, it all turned out pretty good. And um, hopefully he'll be back and he's gained a lot of traction in the States as well. So hopefully he can afford a real, uh, real promoter next time he gets over here. But <laughs> And so, so what was the, how did we get to that on uh, Blue Chili? So that's basically how I ended up um, working out of a co-working space. Okay. And also how I ended up with an ABN and realizing that I could freelance because I realized I couldn't afford to actually be a, a booking and promotions person in the event space, entertainment yeah. um, industry. But I realized through all the skills that I leveraged to put basically pull that off that I had between those skills and my, and my social social media savvy and my market research background and abilities that I could help people with their early stage venture ideas, reach markets and validate them or invalidate them quickly. So I basically turned that concept into freelancing for people who are trying to either get media projects or um, app ideas or anything really that, you know, needed an audience and a bit of quick validation off the ground. Okay. And with that, I met the girls um, and Ahmed who were doing that startup show because they were headquartered out of Hub at the time. Um, and that's how I ended up connecting with um, with Alan initially. Okay. And learning a bit more about their need for someone on the ground to help get Melbourne off the ground. This is Alan, the evangelist, Alan Jones. Yes. <laughs> the, the Alan, our Alan Jones, yeah. which is the real Alan Jones. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the funny thing is, uh, so I, I met him, had an interesting conversation, um, asked my friend Sally who knew him and, and knew what kind of work I was doing, um, at the time, if she thought it was a good idea to have a, a little more formal conversation around, um, what they were looking for here in Melbourne to get, a Melbourne location off the ground. And she's like, yeah, definitely. I'll totally do that. So I got that uh, email introduction just as I was hopping a plane to Tassie to go have a nice little trip around Tassie for a week or so. And then as soon as I got back, um, had a meeting with him that I thought I totally screwed up because he completely disarmed me and I wasn't in like interview mode. I just was really comfortable in myself and said my real crazy okay. thoughts. Yeah. And then I walked out of that and was just like, what the hell just <laughs> happened? Why did you say that? Why did you do that? Okay. Well, at least you tried. <laughs> and then the funny thing is that was a af afternoon coffee. And at the end of the coffee, he was like, like, what's going on tonight? What, what are you doing tonight? Because he knew I was a bit of a startup social butterfly and there's a bunch of things going on, but I was like, actually I'm, I'm tapping out of everything to go 
celebrate a contract I just finished with my one of my craziest clients um, at this whiskey bar. And he was like, that sounds cool. Can I join you? <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I, I basically ended up... This is in the interview or... This is basically follow-up interview. Okay. Was taking him to Whiskey and Ailment, teaching him about Australian whiskey, and then just shooting the shit on podcasts and crazy travel adventure yeah. stories and all that good stuff. Okay. And so... And that's basically how I... And pretty much like the next day, it was like a little bit of back and forth. Here's a contract. Do you want to start with us? Okay. Wow. There you go. A lot of my life decisions started or had some component with the next thing I knew I was drinking with a guy at a bar. No, it's not what you think. I was on the bus to the jungle the next day. Yeah, right. Well, you know, like no good sto- what is it? No good story ever started with salad. Yes. That quote? Yeah. I feel like that's a Simpsons quote or something. It is, yeah. yeah. Um You don't make friends with salad. You don't make friends with yes. salad. Uh yeah, wow. Well. Um okay, so you've been at Blue Chili for how long now? Two years. Two years? So okay. Two years. So that was Just, two years ago? Yep. And the first startup whiskey event that I went to, which I think was the first one, was a year and a so a year or so ago, wasn't it? Yeah, about a year and a half. It was I started putting them together in May, I think it was June. Okay. And what where did that come from? Where did the uh where was the love for whiskey and then the events born from, I guess? So it was a natural progression of a series of events. Um, I've been interested in whiskey since I was handed a glass of 60 something, a dollar, a nip, Pappy Van Winkle in LA when I was still living out of a backpack on my friend's couches, mind you. That was like my food budget for two weeks wow. back in those days. Um, and it was it was lovely. And I didn't know what it was, was the best part. I was just handed this thing by my friend who was super excited. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try this whiskey. I like whiskey, but I didn't really have much of a, a palate, as they say. So I thought. Um, and it was freaking tasty. And I guess as I traveled, I just gravitated towards it because it's full of great stories. It's a natural amalgamation of human story and connection to land and natural resources. I actually find it a great way to teach people who say they don't care about the environment, um, about the importance of things like clean water and, you know, not screwing up your air quality and things like that. You can't, you can't make good whiskey with either bad water, bad air, you know, crap barley. You have to have, you have to, treat the land right in order to get good stuff out of the barrel. I've never thought of using that with the argument for it, for being pro climate change. So Oh, when I was living using in, everyday things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, when I was living in Georgia, um especially going to the school I did in undergrad, there were a lot of, you know, it was good old boys and it was hippies in the same college, uh just like a subset of the university. And and a lot of times it was quite divided, basically between your um, your preservationists and your conservationists. So conservationists want to use the things for human purposes, and preservationists are just like, no, you should lock it all away. Like, don't even let people in there kind of camp. Um, and even with the conservationists, a lot of times the priorities will still always begin at, be in an end with, with humans. And, and especially the, the short term, you know, turn a dollar kind of perspective. This quarter is more important than, you know, your grandkids' ability to know that a park exists. <laughs> um, fair enough. But I always loved with the good old boys and even just out in town in Georgia and Athens, pointing out that beer would get more expensive if there's less water and it takes more time and energy and therefore money to yeah. get water clean enough to be able to make beer. Okay. So if you drink beer, you should care about climate change. There you go. It's such a brilliant <laughs> argument. I've just never thought about using that. And and the um, to go back to the Whiskey Social uh, conception story, or Startup Whiskey Club as it was in that instance, Yeah. Um, I really saw the opportunity, well, twofold. One, it was to make life a little bit easier on me because people kept coming to me asking to curate whiskey nights for them. 
Um, and as I dug a bit deeper in that, I got, I basically found the, the problem that the startup is solving, which is people were ashamed or not comfortable going and asking the kinds of seemingly or stupid questions that they wanted to ask in whiskey tastings. Yeah. So the tastings that are commercially put on by the the brands and sometimes the bars just didn't appeal to people because they felt like they had to know stuff already to go into them, which is not the case at all. But it showed that there was a a disconnect in market and community events offering. And then, and it was just easier for me to get all these people in one room and do it together. Yeah. And the kinds of people that were coming to me wanting to learn about whiskey really needed to know each other. So the for those first few um, months, I really made an effort into trying to make sure that it was a good... Um, I, I invited as large a portion of the various types of communities that I was part of so that we could have you know investors there and start up um, early stage founders and mid-stage founders and you know, tech guys and people working on um, super cool AI algorithms and all this kind of stuff. Basically, I was trying to kind of nudge slash curate my community into yeah. a place where, you know, you're not telling them what they should do. You're just getting in a room, asking some big questions and stepping away. Yeah. And that's kind of generally how I like to put on any kind of event, even if I'm you know moderating a panel for startup stuff. Okay. Now, I'm interested to hang around and talk about whiskey further. Uh, what for those listening at home what is sort of the i'm interested to hear about the whiskey tasting and appreciation process because um it's it's a little bit different to wine isn't it a little bit but a lot of similarities so anyone who has done wine tastings um will be moderately familiar with whiskey tastings Obviously, the biggest difference is that you have to really go slow because your liquid is 40% alcohol by volume and above. Um, when you approach it, you need to approach it a lot more carefully. So if you have people who are used to tasting wine, a lot of times they'll take a whiskey snifter. Um, ideally, you serve them in a, in a Glen's, Glen Cairns glass or something with curved edges uh, when I do my events at, at random bars and can't bring our own glassware, I typically always have to con- convince them to let us have it in wine glasses instead of the straight edge highballs because that's actually much better. So just like with wine, you want to have those um, aromatic oils have as much space and uh, ability to kind of do their thing in the glass and you lose a lot more of it with the straight edge glasses. Um, so you, the best way to nose it and you always um, – Certainly you can look at color, appreciate color, you know, be all mindful, whatever you want to say, but whiskey really can't and shouldn't be judged on color. Okay. Um, it should be judged on aroma and taste on your palate. Um, so when you nose it, you actually want to open your mouth a little bit. Um, and also I find that this is actually much better for people who are really new to tasting spirits, um, is actually if you take a couple drops on clean hands with no... Um, smelly soaps or lotions or anything on it. Okay. Take a few drops on your hand and rub uh, that drop of whiskey in between your hands. It burns off the alcohol quite quickly. Not dissimilar to when you spray perfume on yourself in the shops to try perfume. The alcohol burns off quite quickly with the heat and dispersion because it's such a small amount. And then you get the, um, typically you get the malty or the honey or the whatever the major overtones are on the nose. You t- don't always get the more delicate tones, but you get the uh, the front of the nose quite quickly and easily there. So it's um, there is a tolerance for the higher alcohol level that you acquire with time in terms of being able to both smell and taste. So a lot of times, um, and every time I run a tasting, because every whiskey is different, and even if you've had this that whiskey dozens of times before, our palates change from day to day, depending on what we've eaten, mm. what's happening with hormones in our body. Yeah. If you know we have a head cold, all these things. But um, it's always good to have a couple drops of distilled water uh, on the table, or like little pots of distilled water, and you just add water drop-wise to the whiskey to help open up, basically 
breaks down the oils and um, when makes... You say, when you say distilled, like filtered water? Yeah. Okay. Not, um, any, not mineral water, basically water that doesn't have any sort of salts okay. in it. Yeah. Um, when, when you're tasting, what, is, what are sort of um, some of the things that are often overlooked by people when they're tasting? Um, you know, like I'm thinking about when you taste, because my background obviously in, is in hospitality and wine, when a lot of people um, taste wine, they're often just, uh, they get so, like, because it's sort of like that pseudo-intellectual thing about wine, right? They sort of like really get so into concentrating on the the nose of the wine that they don't actually just, when they sip it, they don't just really appreciate it and understand whether it's good or not. Um, I'm just thinking about is there something similar with whiskey that's o- often overlooked there? Definitely. I would say the the equivalent is people struggling to pull the right words from the word bank, so to speak, um, and and saying that they just don't they don't have the palate. But when they say they don't have the palate, they're really what they're really thinking or feeling is that they don't have the words. They don't feel like they have the right words. And this is another thing that's different with how I run tastings and um, appreciation classes is yes, I have a, there's a little box of all the different aromas and yes, there's specific words that you, that do go with specific characteristics of both the aromas and the tastes, but to get people started and just to get to build their confidence and build their own sort of tasting style and language, I'll just do a totally basic word association. What does it make you think? What does it make you feel? There's no wrong answers. You know, close your eyes and picture yourself drinking this whiskey somewhere. Where do you picture yourself? Do you have food on the table? You know, are you smoking a cigar? You know, anything, just pretty much a pure sensory experience of just be in the moment with that experience what comes to you mm-hmm. and there's no wrong answers and what was one of my one of my favorite tasting notes from uh we had a special guest um industry guest in at the last one at the december event and he was passing around a a really beautiful um uh scottish 15 year single malt um and <laughs> Um, it was it was funky on the nose and it was a little bit funky on the palate, but funky, interesting, not bad. And uh, two of my friends described it as a honey covered foot. What? They're like, it tastes like a honey covered foot. I like that. But not that's, in a bad way. That's cool. And so those are the kinds of tasting notes that we get out of my I, I feel event. like there's a book coming out from that, this. It's just, it's about not taking yourself too seriously and yeah. just giving it a good solid go and you're not going to like everything. And that's the way that I curate the kinds of whiskeys that I put at the events that they're around a theme. They're just to get to really show the variety and breadth of what this, you know, seemingly simple liquid can do um, based on where it's made really. And a few different tweaks and yeah. And to get people thinking. And then that kind of, that opens the conversation to lots of, different things it's not it's not all about all about whiskey the whiskey is the conversation starter and the thing that brings people together and ultimately it's about starting cool conversations do you find that because you would have obviously bought or had to select quite a few whiskeys by now for these events stories hold on i have the number on the uh on the website yeah you do i just finally just added that is it hundreds or thousands oh it'd be no, nothing would be thousands at this point in time. Let's see, what is it? 1,230 tastes. And that's probably actually, that's that's what we're saying formally. Um, so that's like drams of whiskey poured and uh, at least 85 different expressions. Yeah. What is a dram of whiskey for those? So that un- the- that's the jargony term for the a nip. nip. Okay. Yeah. And so... You've selected quite a few now. What do you think is sort of the sweet spot in terms of qu- uh, cost to quality? Like, for example, when I'm selecting wine, um, it sort of depends on the ranges that you're looking at, but you can often find this sort of sweet spot at like 25 to $30 and then 
um, 100 to $120 when you start getting into the age stuff. What do you find or what have you noticed? Like are there certain age brackets like 15 years, 20 years and X amount or it just you, depends? You can't, go, you can't go on age because these days with whiskey being made all over the world, a uh, a four-year whiskey made, for, made out of Australia or even um, – uh, India, there's a, a fair few really fantastic Indian whiskeys. Um, four years in those warmer climates is equivalent to eight to ten years in Scotland uh, or parts of Canada because of the climactic conditions. Wow. And even that's changing. So that's one of the interesting things. Yet again, going back to the whole climate natural change, resource, yeah. like why should people care about climate change thing? Um, as the as conditions are changing, as seasons are becoming more erratic and not historically where they have been in terms of uh, weather and climate, the the young guns who used to be, you know, Japan, Japan started making whiskey in 1920-something. Yamazaki was founded in 19, 1927. Mm. Um, so they're by no means new kids on the block, really, but compared to Scotland and Ireland, they are. Yeah. Um, their techniques and... Um, innovations have been and australia and you know taiwan and india the the new world um whiskey production techniques are going to be critical to helping the industry evolve yeah and also in terms of of understanding markets and speaking to markets and rebranding and positioning and all that good stuff yeah you mentioned before i guess um new world so in the whiskey world what's new and old oh i'm definitely not the critical uh answer on this but so it's sort of india australia well japan i think japan could fall into old world but i'd have to i'd have to phone a friend for that one yeah. um I, so basically scotland and ireland and scotland and ireland inarguably are old world yeah and everyone else is new yeah, yeah. um i will lump some of the heritage brands in the u.s that date back to equivalent times of Scottish heritage yeah. brands. It's, it's the same thing in wine. Like, you know, there used to be this whole argument, old world, new world. I mean, Chile, people say old world, but Chile, Chilean wine has been there since the 1800s. So it's sort of a silly argument. Yeah, but the French have been doing it for a lot longer. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yep. Um, do you have a favorite whiskey at the moment? It changes every few months, but I'm still, uh, I guess I'm still giving this answer because I still have the bottle. Once it's out, I don't know if I can afford to replace it, if I can even find it. But um, I am, I'm in love with actually this one particular Japanese distillery that I haven't been to yet, but I will get there on my next trip um, called Chichibu. And they put out uh, these expressions here called a Kiro's malt. Uh, it's Shiro's, I don't speak Japanese. Um, and the they do a, Mizunara triple wood. Um, so that basically means that it's been aged in three different kinds of wood. And, um, Mizunara wood is a, is the form of white oak that is used for whiskey production and, um, barrel aging in Japan. And it's a, it's a really fascinating type of oak and just makes a really fantastic liquid. Yeah. Well, I actually haven't asked the actual, if we could give like a general process of making whiskey, is it you take some sort of a grain. It has, um, has to be a cereal be, grain. Yeah, cereal grain. Um, distill it, age it in a barrel, and f in some cases do like a solera where they mix it over many different barrels. Um, yeah, so there's all sorts of things that you can do with the barrel age process and then what happens between barrel and bottle. Mm -hmm. Um so a uh, good example is of the Solera process is the uh, Starward production down the road. So Starward, our local uh, big Melbourneian distillery, yep. um, they they do their core product as a Solera cask. So that's um, one of the benefits of that approach to barrel to bottle is that you can have a lot more consistency, but still it's still considered a single malt, and you still have that that interesting character because the problem with just straight blends is typically if you're, if you're blending for any sort of commercial scale and 
Dave always was going for commercial but quality, um, you actually end up having it be kind of boring because it's about that consistency. If you go buy a bottle of Johnny Blue anywhere in the world now and even and open it next to a properly ate, you know, properly stored bottle of Johnny Blue from, you know, five or even probably ten years ago and uncracked and pour them side by side, theoretically, if everyone was doing their job, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. Mm. And some people love that and some people want to go for more, you know, interesting dynamic type of product. So it all just depends on what you're going for and also kind of what your risk appetite is um, as a brand, as a, as a distillery, as a um, production organization. What, um, I'm interested to know what, I mean, you've seen, you obviously read a lot. I've, I've seen a lot of your retweets about stuff happening in the industry in whiskey and, and all that sort of stuff. What has doing this, the whiskey social, these events, learning about the industry as a whole, has, has it taught anything to yourself that you've replicated elsewhere at all? Hmm. I'm thinking. <laughs> now keep in mind Genetic these. Pause. Yeah, the, these answers don't have to be answered because sometimes some people just haven't. No, I think there is because there's. It's what I'm doing with Whiskey Social as a as a social club, as an evolving community. Um, I think I have actually really brought that experience to my role and my work with startups and founders with blue chili, um, in terms of getting people comfortable with trying things that very likely won't work. So the thing is in startup land, or sorry, in, in whiskey land, when you make an experiment, even if it's only a couple of barrels, you're talking about at least a couple grand worth of the distillery's actual cash, you know, potential earnings that you're putting on the line. And typically it takes anywhere from three to four to more years of age to wait for things to work. So I kind of like to bring some of the stories of, you know, the risk and the failure that I've learned from meeting people in the whiskey industry to the, startup conversations that I've had to kind of put it in perspective. You're like, you know what? If you spin up a website and a, you know, conceptual brand and test some things and it doesn't work out, how much worse off are you? And what do you know? And when sometimes when you put things next to each other like that, um, it puts, it puts things in perspective and people like, Oh yeah, it isn't that scary. I should really do that. I should go test that. Okay, I'm going to go test that. Yeah. I'm like, yes, <laughs> convince somebody to go try something. Yeah. In terms of um, what we're talking about, putting things in perspective, I'm interested to know and I ask this of every guest, um, is there a lesson that you've learnt, whether it's directly or indirectly? So directly maybe they've told you or indirectly you've just seen it over many years, saying that you've learnt from your parents that has stuck with you over time. Um, the example I always, I, I use two different examples for my parents, but for, for my mum, it's, um, being able to not take things so seriously. So being able to have a laugh. I'm yep. interested to see if there's anything you've taken there. There's one thing that I definitely attribute a large part of how I maneuver the world and probably why I've been quite successful and actually quite safe dis- despite making lots of seemingly bad decisions in life, which is to just approach everyone and treat everyone that you come across in life with the equal amount of respect and dignity and patience, whether they're, you know, the CEO of a fortune 500 company or, you know, the person cleaning the kitchen or, you know, cleaning your office at seven o'clock at night while you're still at your desk. You know, we're all just here on this earth trying to do a job, you know, make best for ourselves and our family and hopefully leave this world a better place than we found it. And you're not going to agree with everyone. 
some people are probably going to rub you the wrong way, but everyone deserves that first approach of, um, of respect and dignity and essentially let people have that until they completely disprove they otherwise, yeah. in which case just remove yourself from the situation. Is this, is this something that they told you directly or you just saw that through the actions that they, they made? Yeah. Through my mom's actions. Okay. Um, do you have any principles that you help that sort of guide you through decision making or I don't know how you go about your daily life? Like, for example, I, I often look at valuing my time over money. So I'm often weighing up the opportunity cost is a key thing. Um, I, I'm thinking about, you know, I did, was living out in the suburbs and I was looking at moving house and it was, do I move into the city or do I stay or go somewhere close by? Um, and it turns out if you have taken to account the time. Yep. <laughs> That's why yeah. I live in the city now too. Yeah, it's like a tiny bit more than what cost of living was in the suburbs. But yeah. I calculated it, and then right it's off the, the bat, I was like, I get like five to seven hours of extra time. Um, yeah, why would you do? Yeah, and why? I still get. I I go and spend you know more of that time listening to podcasts at the gym instead of standing on a smelly tram. Exactly. So, do you have anything that sort of guides you at all? Yeah. So, um, definitely the. Uh, the value of time um, is a big influence on me. And I, the other one is, and I've actually started trying to hack together some really basic little digital tools to start tracking this, but emotional energy, really prioritizing, um, balancing my daily meetings and workflow and choice of how and when I spend time on certain things to optimize the emotional energy that I'm able to put into any given, um, either content creation or editing, reviewing, or definitely working with founders or meeting new people to, to help put on events or, or connect people for whatever purpose they're working on. Um, I think that we only have a finite amount of, you know, good decision juice in us in any given day. And there's certain people that probably don't realize they're doing it, but for better or worse, they're energy vampires. Yeah. And and certain things, you know, even if everyone there is there with positive, hardworking intentions, you know, certain things like doing intense workshops are very emotionally draining. So saying, yeah. you know, setting myself up to go finish making a website after I went, after I taught a four hour workshop in any given day is just not going to work. Yeah. That is setting myself up for failure. Um, it, took a good decade or so of learning self-awareness to realize this. Um, but I, I really would like to get to a point where um, I make a little, probably just like put it together in type form to push to Google, Google Docs, um, make a little survey and actually check in with myself a couple times during the day, kind of like how there's some of those mindfulness apps um, that do the th same thing. Check in with myself after certain meetings with a little um, just like three question survey and and actually start getting some real data to be able to track um, more in in the moment uh, snapshots of my emotional energy because generally you're so busy during the day that you don't even I, mean, I forget to eat let alone stop and check in with my Man. mental and emotional well-being I'm so bad like that so I think I think that's important because I think that's what um, keeping or not keeping that in check is what drives good people to make bad decisions and what makes people you know hate things like networking. Mm. Like I've given a couple of talks on networking and my a number one tip is don't force yourself to do it. If you, if you really hate networking in general, like totally as a skill, don't do it. Try a couple things to try to figure out if you can find what you're passionate about and therefore find a way to care. If you're just really not feeling it and you can't be present and interested in the moment with other humans, don't bullshit it. Cause it just comes off as, gross and no one wants to be around that yeah do you have then any habits during your week like do you journal once a week or do you like make sure that you get x amount of hours of sleep or do you My, meditate i do i do mindfulness meditation um which definitely helps 
And the other big thing that um, I learned about, I think from one of the business bloggers or vloggers online, I can't remember, um, way back when, probably Oprah said it at some point, uh, is I do the, uh, the three gratitudes. Sometimes you can do three gratitudes and three, um, three things that you're looking forward to in that day. So basically first thing in the morning, when you first wake up, you know, my mind wanders a lot, so it can take anywhere from five to 10 minutes to actually get through with this. But you think you think in vivid detail of three things that you're really grateful for and ideally things that aren't materialistic because those can get taken away quite quickly. Yeah. No, I, I do the same. I've sort of combined many different ways of, I guess, journaling things like grateful, practicing gratefulness and stuff like that. I find it very useful. I only do it once a week though. So, um, you know, I've seen that there's things like, um, Tim Ferriss has that, uh, five minute journal, things mm-hmm. like that. I feel like, are very useful. They're extremely useful. And for a period, both while I was researching tools for my own depression and anxiety, and when I was trying to steer my mother towards some stuff that would help her, um, when she was basically between therapists that she could deal with, she had to fire one. Um, there's a really interesting, uh, professor out of, he was out of university of Texas, I think. Um, and he has this body of work called the secret life of pronouns. Okay. And, um, and he's done a bunch of studies about basically what our writing says about us. Um, and, and then has flipped it and tested if you can basically rewire your thinking to be more humble, be more approachable, um, you know, basically change the way that you maneuver the world by changing your words and the words that you use and therefore the words that you think with. And it's, it's promising. So, yeah, no, I I agree with that. I think linguistics is um, one of those things that is under tapped when it comes to changing your cognition or psyche or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you say that new, that new movie arrival? Or have you seen that new movie arrival? There's one of the quote is, um, I've said this a few times now, it's something like uh, language is the first uh, weapon drawn in a battle or war. So, um, yeah, I think what you're saying sounds about right. Um, using language and so forth to change your mentality is very useful. Um, I'm interested to, to know, based on what you've learned now um, around startups, what are some of the greatest lessons that you've learned um, around the skills that allow people to succeed? What, what have you noticed over the time now, it's two years, you said before, um, at Blue Chili that has allowed, I guess, founders to succeed? I'll definitely answer that. But first, do you want me to explain my uh, my role at Blue Chili yes. for yeah. our audience because yeah. I didn't actually get into that yeah. um, with the bio. So <laughs> I so I was brought on as you know broad brush community manager, but I didn't really have a community to manage. So I had to essentially make the community for Blue Chili Melbourne here because it was an established brand in a morpheus sense, but founders hadn't had an actual physical place to call their business home by day um, as they're building their startup. So was, I built that community. And then that role evolved into, um, where I am now, which is the startup market manager. Um, and I also now have, um, expanded into being a business advisor for the startups. So I'm kind of part researcher, part events producer, and a lot business coach. So the, I think the number one, most valuable two, I said two most valuable skills, everything else can be learned. If you have this, two most valuable skills for being a startup founder. And by startup, I use the Steve Blank definition of that. So a temporary organization created to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Two most important things is the ability and desire to learn, learn quickly and be able to execute on that knowledge and the ability to be humble and self-aware with your ideas, with yourself, 
with how you and your idea, which is all you, all a startup is at the beginning, um, are maneuvering in the world yeah. and, you know, who loves you and who hates you and why. And obviously, you know, in the digital space, there will always be trolls and you can't listen too much to the haters, but there, there is value in knowing who your audience and therefore customers aren't. And a lot of times that can be super valuable in getting you quicker to who your real true customer base is. Yeah. So being, being able to learn and be humble is just means that there's less barriers for the person to get to that repeatable business model, essentially. We're going to spend a lot less time doing things the way you think they should be done, <laughs> even if <laughs> it's not the best way for it to be done or it's blatantly not working. Yeah. I, I read, um, I was reading your uh, blog post on invalidation and yeah, identifying a market and the opportunity. What what do you think is key for someone identify, identifying or validating an opportunity? Because I feel like it's one of those things that is just so often overlooked when oh, it comes to startups. Extremely overlooked. Um, you know, the no market fit seems to be the one of the core reasons why people fail. Yep. The biggest thing is don't start building anything until you have at least a couple dozen people that say the problem is real, say they would actually consider paying for a solution, ideally actually get some pre-sales in some way, shape or form in an ethical and honest way. And ask them not just what product would they like, but really understand where it sits in their life. So I think people just think about product life cycle, but they don't really think about product life cycle as it actually sits in somebody's workflow or in somebody's home life or in somebody's, you know, personal and professional growth, depending on, you know, where, what, where the problem is that they're solving, that the, the startup product or service is addressing. And I think that that's actually going to get more and more difficult. And I think the people who really clearly understand and can help engineers and politicians and, you know, media companies and whoever else navigate this, this liminal cultural space of occupying different worlds at different times for different purposes, um, in terms of both geopolitical as well as other types of cultural is going to be extremely valuable. Okay. When, um, when a startup is struggling, I guess, to stay the course with their idea, this is probably going back to being able to learn and be humble, what sort of recommendation, recommendations or advice do you typically provide? I don't you hear about like pivoting and yep. whatnot. Yep. Um, so pivoting is a totally normal and natural thing to do um, while you're going down your startup path. You just want to make sure that it's actually based on legitimate data from your market that you should actually be listening to, that you're not listening too much to a couple of squeaky wheels, that if you actually go back to the numbers, you know, if two or three customers really hate your product enough to not want to use it and maybe even talk smack about it on the internet, how much are they really worth? Yeah. Maybe they weren't really your customers. Maybe they're really avid early adopters, just like serial early adopters. But the second that you start actually making something that will be more valuable and useful to your real broad target audience, um, they might drop off the wagon. That's okay. So putting it in perspective with the numbers in terms of who is your actual target market, but it all goes back to what's the problem you're solving. And that's sort of the, the market side of the equation. And why are you personally the hero to take on this, this startup challenge? Um, and, that goes back to people talking about, you know, the concept of stealing your stealing ideas, which I think is hilarious. Um, you can only steal execution. You can't steal ideas. Yeah. Um, and you know, what drives you? And I, I highly recommend founders actually personally write up and put in their physical space or have a reminder on their digital desktop or something. Why are they doing this? Like what's their personal internal motivation? There's a million and one problems in the world for any of us to run out and solve. But unless we actually have a personal emotional tether to a reason why we want to address it, you're going to lose your momentum after the first, you know, 17 times you've been struck in the face by a wave. I'm, um, 
I'm wary of uh, time, so I probably want to flip to the short and sharp questions now. Okay. Um, you were mentioning before we were chatting to ask about books. Um, if you were to gift a book or recommend a book, a book to someone, what would it be? Or what would you typically give someone? It depends what I know about them um, and what they like. But because I know what books are really valuable and important to me, but I don't assume that most other people have that perspective. How about what What have been your top books that you've read over the years and why? So the one that we that I referenced before and I reference quite often um, on a personal level, but also I bring this into my professional work a lot too, um, a book called Presence. There's a different title for it in the US. The UK version is just called Presence, um, The Power of Positivity in All Aspects of Your Life or something like that uh, by a uh, historically she was a Shakespeare acting coach um, turned vocal coach slash therapist um, named Patsy Rod- R- Rosenberg Rodenberg um, Rodenberg I believe sorry we can look at yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all available on Amazon um, and the the first book of hers that I actually read that was the second book of hers that I read the first book of hers um, I read was actually um, oh, I'm blanking on the title now. It'll come to me later. But it was it was the work she did recounting um, working with uh, women who'd been battered in domestic violence cases and learning about the uh, this phenomenon of devoicing, um, which actually goes to a a portion of our basically limbic brain being so screwed up that or our brain being so screwed up that the limbic brain pretty much t- is given full reign to do that's like your lizard brain to do what it wants. And it's just, can I, can I like totally curse here? Yeah. For sure. It's just freak the fuck out and it's just shut down and been like this, this environment isn't safe. You just need to like make yourself disappear. And like the, the smaller and quieter and more invisible you are, the better because this place isn't safe. And it, can it manifests itself in the form of stutters and sometimes literally people not being able to vocally project themselves. But the interesting thing that psychiatrists and psychologists and all sorts of, of various specialists have been able to find with people like this is they actually are able through music or sometimes acting, they're very able to actually engage the mechanics. It's not a mechanical problem. If you put them in a, in a creative scenario, a lot of times these people can actually sing amazingly well or perform with presence and gusto. It's a, it's a, it's a psychological, physiological link that needs to basically be unpacked and you can actually trick the, um, not trick, but you can you can work backwards from the physiological. So you go through and do all of these various breath and body work activities to get people to articulate with their physical voice, and it will and with time, like it takes a lot of time, but they can actually regain their voice and then therefore regain their their presence and their confidence and their ability to um, move and engage with the world. And I found the concepts that she puts forward just incredibly powerful. And she has this idea that and anyone can have it. So it came from this idea that in acting schools, and I had a bunch of friends that went through acting conservatories and they're horrible, horrible places. <laughs> I mean, if you thought med school was like cutthroat, damn. Um, this idea that a lot of teachers are like, no, nah, there's, you know, you sort the kids, the ones that have it and the ones that don't, you know, the ones that are going to be in the front row and the other ones that are just like not chorus line, like you, you're not going to be a star. And she basically took the theory of, no, anyone can learn how to have presence and be powerful in a, um, in a acting or any other sort of performance and, that kind of space. And you mentioned something um, earlier about uh, there was the different forms as well. Uh, so the presence, the book presence, um, it, she outlines her theory of three circles. Okay. Yeah. So that's, so that's what that speaks to. So it's, it's a 
basic framework for understanding energetic presence and actually find it very useful to talk about the way people um, think about uh, gendered presences or energies. And typically, if I catch myself saying feminine energy or masculine energy, I will actually step back and, and remind myself that, you know, I grew up in this particular time and place where Western culture said, you know, we're traditionally told to be more first circle. So I'll say first circle instead of um, feminine, if that's what I'm thinking of. So in, you know, traditional Western society, it's changed with the couple waves of feminism we've had, but women are supposed to be seen and not heard and, you know, be, be soft and non-confrontational. Um, and that's generally what a first circle energy is. So first circle is uh, a very closed body language, shortness of breath, not looking people in the eye, basically with everything you're doing and saying, you're trying to be as invisible as possible. Mm. So that's going back to that you know, limbic brain. Things are not safe. You are not supported. This is not somewhere to be open and inquisitive and receptive. Third circle is the other end of the spectrum. And it is a spectrum. So it's you're not one camp or the other. You occupy all these different energies at any given point. Like at, depending on the scenario, yeah. Yeah, depending on the scenario. Um, third circle is what most people try to push um, startup founders to pitch in, and I have a lot of problems with this, um, which is, you know, your Superman pose, your <laughs> taking up a lot of space you're you know you're projecting way too yeah. much and yeah. you're just you're occupying as much of that other person's space and energy as you possibly can and it's really overwhelming it's one of the things one of the reasons why people say they don't like net networking because either they feel like they have to do that or other people feel like they have to do that and you're just constantly getting smashed in the face with everyone everyone's energy and it's draining um, and especially if it's if it's not your normal energetic presence, it's really tiring. You can only put on that facade for so long before you pretty much collapse. And then second circle is the middle ground of all of those. So that's what I think is easiest to conceptualize is your flow zone. Okay. So that's where you're, you're meeting someone else's energy in the middle. You're conscious of their energy and respectful of it. And you're only giving or taking as much time and energy and focus as they are wanting or willing to engage with. Do you have an exercise routine? I do. I don't exercise as much as I would like to. I used to climb and surf and all really? the good stuff, but yeah. So you did like rock climbing or what, what do they call it when you're off the cable? Bouldering. Bouldering. That's yeah. Well, or you can, you can free climb anything, but you got to be a crazy bastard to do that. <laughs> um, I learned how to climb because I was in California for long enough that I think they force you to learn or they kick you out. Um, <laughs> in in the circles I was running in, it was pretty much second, required. I, I took that. I took that very <laughs> literally. I was like, <laughs> like you have to what you have to. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. So I was I was living and working out of you know places like Joshua Tree and Yosemite and um, good little bouldering spots in Malibu and whatnot. Um, so I was I was really lucky and had great people to teach me and uh, yeah and learn how to climb and I just found it a great way. I really I really like climbing as a physical activity because of the combination of the physical challenge as well as the mental challenge. And um, I spent some time back in DC to help my mom recover from some knee surgery uh, for a few months, a couple of years back and started going to an indoor climbing gym there because it was dead of winter in Northeast America. And, uh, and actually played around a little bit with uh, climbing blindfolded. And I was so much better at it because inside on a top rope, like there's, it's, you're safe. You're safer than walking across the street. Um, and it really pr it tested and proved that I'm just overthinking things. Yeah. I'm actually Fine. physically a good climber, but I'm actually mentally not a great climber because I overthink things. Right. And I think you learn a lot about yourself in life doing that. Do you, do you have any like favorite climbing spots over the years? And do you, you know, if someone was to go climbing, say in Australia, whether it's indoor or like rock climbing out on circuits, uh, where would you suggest? So I haven't actually 
climbed that much in Australia. I went to one of, I went to the indoor gym in the city once and it just got really frustrating because I was sitting around off the wall more than actually yeah. climbing. Yeah. Um, and the only other place in Australia, oh no, that's not true. So I climbed at, um, a, a Ripley's, a Lipple, a Lipley's? I can never remember, pronounce it right. The Greek sounding place, I mean, right. yeah. um, out in the country. Uh, and I climbed, I had a great time one time when I was back in my backpacker days, many moons ago, um, climbing in the blue mountains, uh, came like millimeters away from putting my finger in a funnel web home. So that was fun. Um, and I was, and we were like a good 20 minute hike out from any road. So that would have been bad, but those are the lovely experiences that like, I actually prefer outdoor climbing to indoor. Um, what, what, what's been some of the shocking things about like culturally when you move to Australia, like it could be, cause a lot of, um, I guess Americans, Canadians often talk about all these things that will kill you in uh, Australia, but I feel like America has more. Like you've got bears and guns and guns and wolves. Bears with guns will really kill you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was I always find that really fascinating because I've been in love with snakes since I was a wee little child. So that was the first thing that I learned about Australia, and actually, pretty much, probably why I'm here. Um, to be honest, because I wasn't really that big of a reader. I was more keen to like go outside and poke things with sticks, poke, thing, poke things with sticks. Um, and, but I started learning about snakes and then, you know, every two or three seemed to like the craziest ones were like, and it's from this place called Australia. And I'm like, what, where is this place? And why is it so weird? And how do I get there? Um, so it took me till I was 21, but eventually I got here and, yeah, I think str the strangest thing I th think is actually the 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 openness and the the lack of fear and guardedness and willingness to to listen and be interested in other people. I think I feel like people are a lot more up themselves in the states. Yeah. Um, and that might just be because of where I was and the difference between like DC and Georgia and California is quite different. Even just the difference between, um, being in the cities in California versus out in the countries and, um, more regional areas. That's interesting. But I think generally, I think people are all the same and a <laughs> lot of these cultural tropes, you know, come from this great mythology that we like to hold on to, to think we're so different. Exactly. The exceptionalism of our nation. Um, what podcast are you listening to right now? I listen to a lot. Um, well, I listen to the uh, uh, Economist um, highlights pretty much every day. Um, I'm actually going to totally have to cheat. I'm bad at pulling ideas out of thin air, and this is this is how bad it is. Oh, we'll open it up. It's on ninety nine percent invisible, um, which is like everything in. Radiotopia is awesome. Um, the one that I get up on Saturdays and I'm super stoked to go run or go to the gym with. Um, so I do, I do go to a boring ass gym now and just treadmill or rowing machine and then do a little bit of, you know, circuit muscular stuff. But I reward myself going to the gym with podcasts that I really look forward to. Um, the top one being, uh, no such thing as a fish. The, uh, the QI elves have a weekly podcast and it's freaking amazing. Yeah, right. So that was called the, uh, what was that again? Sorry. No such thing as a fish. No such thing as a fish. Okay. And I don't listen to too many just fiction slash storytelling type podcasts. I actually couldn't really, like, I know this makes me a podcast pariah, but... I couldn't get into cereal and I've honestly never been that big into this American life. Yeah. I find it incredibly boring. Um, but I really like snap judgment. Um, that's a really good storytelling one. And there's a couple. Are more. you like me and you find that there's, there's now just a plethora of, uh, podcasts and you struggle to get through all of them. And you've, you've now had to become very selective about what you listen to. 
to some extent, I'm more I'm more selective because I run out of space on my phone, <laughs> and it actually is one of the like I've literally wiped all my music off my phone even, and I I don't um I don't have any music on my phone. It's all um just streamed, but. I think I think I always have like a core group of about 10 to 12 podcasts that I listen to pretty regularly and then I have some that I go hot and cold on. Okay. Music, okay. what do you listen to? Um music lately I've been listening to more kind of just electronic um ambient type stuff because I've been writing a lot. Um the most recent would probably be JT Hazard and a band called Left, uh, which just popped up in my SoundCloud stream. Um, there's a really cool group. Oh, it's called like, oh my God, I'm blanking on it. It's La Bohem something. Um, it's kind of like, we can link it. It's kind of like gypsy sounding music. Um, oh, my Spotify on my phone's not, not working. Um, and then my, my default's always, uh, sort of this core group of a little bit of, um, underground Aussie hip hop and, uh, and independent. Astronautilus. So Astronautilus <laughs> is in my group of, um, Minneapolis, uh, influences. I will get to Minneapolis someday and it's a great way to tell how into hip hop people are like actual hip hop. I always love people say, Oh yeah, I'm into underground hip hop. And you're like, uh-huh, cool. Right. Who? And then, you know, they, they spit off a couple of artists that they've heard on triple J recently. And you're <laughs> yeah. like, really? So, um, yeah. And, and then, you know, the conversation progresses. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know. I really want to get to Minneapolis sometime. And either they light up and they get it. Or um, it's just like, Phew. or they're like, why, why the <laughs> hell would you ever want to go to Minneapolis? Like, Basically, two short answers to that. One, Prince. And two, who's influenced like every genre of music pretty much from the 80s and beyond. Um, he was an amazing artist. He, he, was, he was just in another world. He was a visionary in lots of ways. Um, <laughs> and and the the mayor even goes to hip-hop gigs. So, it's, it's, a, it's kind of the Austin of the North west uh or north like north middle bit um in a lot of ways and has just put out some really cool artists so i listened to a whole bunch of artists um from doomtree collective one that's been um doing quite well from minneapolis now I've seen on a couple of the comedy shows i watch on tv and stuff called uh, her name is lizzo okay. really really great artist um and then the kind of the like grandfather of my time oh, there's two of like grandfathers of hip hop of my, my era um which is Aesop Rock and his latest album has so many layers and is this is Aesop Rocky yeah no no Aesop Rock different Aesop Rock way way different very different <laughs> um there's there was a uh a chart that a grad student put out a few years back of taking the first was so either the first 10 lines, the first 10 tracks, no, so first 100 lines or first um, 100 tracks of uh, a cross section of popular hip hop artists at the time, both underground and fairly mainstream, um, where, where they fall in terms of volume of vocabulary. And it was a, it was a bell curve, um, you know, most people being sort of in this middle ground and um, Aesop Rock and was like just so far out to the right. And he actually constantly, when he gets interviewed, gets asked, do your lyrics even mean anything? Or are they just like garbled poetry meant to sound good? Because certain people just can't even, can't even keep up with the, yeah. the uh, pace of words coming at them. And there's so many layers to the stories learn, and yeah. concepts that that he's baked in and the production is amazing as well it's interesting because we had like a poet rapper last week on the podcast so who um his name's tender mcfly so he's done uh he's a local brisbane guy um pretty sure he's like on triple j unearthed i work mm -hmm. with him now but um he yeah he he's done a little f few things here in melbourne i think because of the move that hasn't been doing as much now but um 
yeah, he, there's a, a lot of meaning that goes into his uh, when he raps. There's a lot of meaning that goes into it. Mm-hmm. It's really nice to to see it as well because like you're just sort of really thinking there when when you're listening to the song. It may only be two and a half minutes, but after a while, you're just like just sitting there pondering. Well, and good art will make you think and feel things that you didn't even realize you were capable of. So, and I think that's that's a huge part of my life and what has been able to get me through some really difficult times, both in a in an esoteric emotional sense as well as well as in a literal sense. Because yeah. um, I've had a core group of friends that I met when I was backpacking through my love of hip hop because I got stranded at a TZU show at the Annandale, um, not being able to get back to Manly where I was staying with a different friend. And they were just like, yeah, just come, come on. on back with us. And I spent the weekend in Newtown. It was like, oh my God, Sydney doesn't suck. Last question. Um, if you could have a billboard anywhere in the world and it could say anything at all, what would it be? It's funny because I asked this one recently at dinner last night to a bunch of friends and it's actually quite hard. Yeah, it's a really difficult question because you're like, oh, just one? There's so many idiots in the world. Um, I'll say this just probably because it's so front of mind because of the news, but also because obviously I am unfortunately for better or worse still American. Haven't gotten rid of the passport yet. Um, I would probably buy a billboard as close to right outside Congress as the U S Congress as, um, as I could. And it would just simply say, what would your mother think? And and make the people that work in there that are Would supposed to be doing a job yeah. day in and day out. And some days they just don't. don't. Yeah. Any other job, you just literally sit on your hands and say no. And that is your sole work for that day. You do that for too long, you get fired. Yeah. Um, and they have real problems they're supposed to be addressing. And it's just, yeah, basically just saying no, I refuse to even entertain logical rational adult discourse um is unacceptable and and i feel like if there's any possibility of saving the system we have to save the poor souls who actually decide decided at some point in time to take on this work by reminding them that you know everyone has a mother everyone is a child a lot of them have families of their own you know think about problems in terms of the people who are involved. And I don't care whether you're talking about, you know, the issues with the social security, you know, in, in the U S or the issues of, of systemic radical terrorism, um, around the world from all different corners. It's not something that's isolated in certain areas or restricted to certain cultural sets. Um, you know, you don't fight hate with hate. And you don't feed people by jailing them. You know, what would your mother think? Would you, I mean, I don't know. Maybe these people really would like pee on a homeless person in front of their mother. Maybe their mothers don't care. But if ever there is a chance to, uh, to change opinion, save it, I think that would do it. What would your mother do? Well, let's end with that. What would your mother think? What would your mother think? I really like that. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's been a pleasure. Cheers. No worries. Thank you. Before you head off, thank you for making it this far. It's been a real treat doing this. Like I said, make sure you head to neural.com slash podcast to learn about our prizes. Sign up to our weekly brain food called the Monday Morsels at neural.com slash sign up. That is N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash sign up. Leave us a review. It's really important to us that we can get quality reviews and build feedback as to whether to continue with this. Check us out on Facebook at Neural, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E. 
Until next time, speak soon.